Welcome on in, ladies and gentlemen, Three Bold Takes. Today we do have a special guest. Uh, Clint Lamb has joined the show with us uh, to discuss a little bit more on um, Alabama and the transfer portal um, and things of that nature. Um, so, Clint, I appreciate you joining the show. Um, for those of you that don't know, Clint does uh, work for On3 Sports and is an analyst for the Bama Online um, YouTube channel, putting out content all the time on there. So if you haven't, go ahead and uh, subscribe to them. Um, and check their content out as well. Uh, Clint, thank you again for joining. Yeah, absolutely, fellas. It's going to be fun. Uh, college football's changing pretty drastically, pretty rapidly. So anytime you're able to kind of hop on somewhere and, and hash it out a little bit, I think it's a good time. As we kind of move forward in the world of college football, obviously it's no it's no question, no surprise. If, if you live under a rock, then you may not know this, but the NIL and transfer portal situation is kind of – out of control right now you've got you know you've got teams that are promising this but not delivering you've got bad contracts that are being handed out um thinking texas a&m where a bunch of players said warning you know make sure you read your contract and get people to look at it before you sign that sort of thing um so we know there needs to be restrictions i think everybody knows that but what kind of restrictions should there be or legislation potentially should there be to kind of tone what is just open season craziness down to a manageable rate? I think to some extent, um, it, this is a little bit above my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it just, it feels like it's such a complicated situation and you, you have solutions and then all of a sudden someone throws something at you. It's like, well, that you can't do that because of this. And it's like, oh, that's a good point. Then think about that. And that's happened to me a lot with this. You know, you think you got it all figured out. You think you got a plan. And then it's like, you know, uh, really you don't. But I will say, I think just it's a perfect storm right now. The fact that you've got the academic side of things conflicting with the athletic side as far as the windows, like when classes start and, the you know, see the, the window for the transfer portal or the first window, it needs to give them time to be able to make the move uh to the next program wherever they're going to go but then that's conflicting with the fact that you've got college football playoff teams still trying to prepare for a national championship uh or or a national championship run and they've got guys who are you know distracted thinking about you know should they leave what's their you know role moving forward uh you've got certain i mean not a whole lot of people who are in that conversation are necessarily opting out and and i think that's good um but you've got you know, you're trying to, to make this argument that bowl games still matter, but you got Florida State, you know, 60% of their roster, you know, choosing to leave uh, in one of the biggest bowl games of the year. Um, that's certainly impacting things. And and so it's, uh, I think that's a huge obstacle that needs to be overcome is getting the academic and athletic thing side of things on the same page where the college football season isn't even over yet. And and the guys are making these kind of decisions, which is really impacting everything. I don't know what the solution to that is, though, because it, it, I don't think the these universities are going to prioritize the athletic side of the the foot, but really it's the football side of things. Uh, they're not going to cater to it to a degree where they're altering their own academic schedule. Like I, I just I don't think maybe I'm wrong on that, but I, I highly doubt they would do that. Uh, and so that's a huge problem. I think the fact that you can, it started off as a one-time transfer rule. Uh, and so you've got some of these guys, you know, maybe that just signed with Alabama. Nick Saban chooses to retire. You didn't know that was going to happen. You consider entering the transfer portal when you're like, I'm a freshman. Do I use that one-time transfer now? Or do I wait and see what's going on with this program? Give this a shot. Because if I waste this one-time transfer and I'm essentially just making a different decision coming out of high school than what I actually ended up making. But I've at the same time, I've also wasted that opportunity. Then the NCAA changes. They're like, let's just do what you want. Transfer whenever you want. Um, it's created way too much movement. It, it, what it did was it shifted the power too much into the hands of the athletes. And it's like now restrictions and, and, and limitations that professional sports have these guys on the college level don't. And, and I think that, you know, everybody says, well, you should have the freedom to do this. Or that. It's not how it works. I mean, NBA has to operate a certain way. The NFL has to operate a certain way. 
college football should be the same way. The problem is you've got too many, you know, the NCAA is clearly not going to do anything. Their, their, their time um, is, is come, probably coming to an end sooner rather than later. I think the power, pro, you know, as far as managing this stuff, everybody talks about legislation. I don't know exactly how much that's going to do it. Um, I mean, obviously, if you could get the right people on it and, and create some good uh, legislation on it, that's, you know, maybe you could get something done on that front. But I think the power more, not the power, but the decisions and how this whole thing is going to be implemented, is going to have to come down to conferences. But the problem is, is that, you know, I, I will say, if you do go to a two mega conference system, having two parties talking to each other, trying to figure out how they're going to navigate this is a lot easier to, to do than four or five or whatever. So that could be beneficial. Um, but it, it's, it's difficult because you don't, I, 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 from the get go, I've believed in athletes being able to pro, uh, profit off their name, image and likeness. Like if someone's willing to pay you to do a car commercial because they know in the state of Alabama you're a really popular face and you giving them your endorsement essentially uh, would help their business and help their brand and you as you know as a result can put money in your pocket and and help feed your family. I've always believed in that, but it is pay for play. And you got programs like Florida getting themselves into a mess because now it's you know that they they essentially in some ways have a kid sign a contract and. Now you're in a legal problem where it's like you either have to admit that it was pay for play or you can't really go after him for, you know, not following through with the contract. So it's, it's like, that's the obstacle that teams and, or, and programs are having to deal with. And I'll be curious to see how that ends up playing out, how other teams address this. You're starting to see other, other programs and, and stuff get in trouble. Uh, but it's an absolute mess. And, and the problem is I think, the window needs to be adjusted as far as when guys can transfer. I think that there needs to be some sort of governing body managing how things are done from a financial standpoint, because you've got this misconception that universities are involved with the collectives or, or, or head coaches are involved in the collectives. And I think behind the scenes, they probably are, but you're not allowed to admit that. I mean, they're supposed to be two separately operated entities and it, and it's so it's it's just it's a huge mess and i don't really have i'll be curious to hear y'all's take on it to be honest with you because there's nothing that i i look at and say this would solidify or fix the issue you have a lot of things that you could do but up to this point uh a lot of the stuff that i've seen it's like it, it's creating other obstacles that you got to overcome so i think now that you've opened pandora's box how do you put it back into a degree where you can get a level you know, playing field and everybody operating, you know, above board. You know, you, you mentioned opening Pandora's box and we, we tiptoed around the, the two conferences, mega, like basically making a professional sports league. And, and my question more than anything is how close are we to reaching a point where colleges know, like they admit what's really kind of been true about specifically college football for, the better part of three decades and we quit pretending that it's an athletics plus academic thing. Like how close are we to colleges operating their college football programs like professional sports clubs, uh, abandoning scholarships and abandoning any tie that these guys have to the school as an academic force. And instead they're strictly paid athletes to make a profit for the universities that they wear the logos of. Like how close are we to that as the reality of what college football is? Cause that that's the only path I see where you answer a lot of the problems that occur is to abandon the tie between athletics and academics. And instead it's an athletics on the side that, the colleges essentially become like the, the owners of the clubs and you, you start, you make a commissioner and a league like that's, that's, that's the only way I see to fix the problem, honestly, because then you could at least start when you pull out from the academics, you can at least start to get involved with agents and contracts and just admitting what it, it has become. I don't know if there's a way to fix it other than that, honestly. 
I mean, <laughs> as, as you were saying all that, um, I'm trying, you know, I, I'm saying you're, you're, you're right. Uh, but I'm sitting here imagining that world and that's just, that's so wild to me. You think that some of these athletes are, uh, you know, uh, a lot of Alabama players, Nick Saban retires, they all start jumping in the transfer portal. Where's the love for Alabama? You know, if you think that was a problem before, you know, have th these kids going to class and getting to know, you know, uh, classmates and, and making friends on campus and, you know, doing a lot of those different things. It's like th there's some level of commitment and prod that starts to come along with that. Like that's a part of you it would be no different than an NFL quarterback, a backup who ends up playing for, you know, Josh McCowan playing for 37 teams. You know, it's like, there's just, there's no loyalty anywhere. Um, and it's not that that is a bad thing from, you know, all the way around, but it, it just, this, this whole prod in the sec prod in Alabama, the, the, the pride that the fan base will have has always been connected to the pride that the players have. Uh, that will no longer be the case. And I think that it's already started to happen to an extent, but I think you would even further that distance. And the NFL can survive off of that. But I also think that there's this, there's this certain level. I think fan bases on the college level feel more deeply for their love of their, their team and their players and stuff, their coaches, than NFL teams. Now, I'm not a huge, I don't have an NFL team. Uh, I love watching the NFL, but I'm very fantasy surface level watching certain players, you know, watching former Alabama players, monitoring what they're doing. Uh, and so there's no level of commitment on that level that there has been on the college level for me personally. And maybe that's clouding the way that I perceive things, but it just feels like that the emotion that has been attached to college football has been so much deeper than the NFL. Uh, for, you know, a, a long time. I don't, I mean, maybe always. And I think that that's been muddied a little bit with what's already happened. And when you start doing things like you're talking about, I think you put yourself in a position where that's even worse. And that's what I want to avoid. You've already lost so much. Don't sacrifice more, but you are correct. Like you would solve a lot of these problems. I mean, as far as the academic calendar and the way that it conflicts with things and so you could have one transfer portal window that would help you know that that's postseason that would help the coaches you could get guys on campus that's the big problem is guys want to go ahead and get to their next program and you can't do that if you're not enrolled because you missed that date and so you got to wait until the summer to enroll you miss spring that could have helped you from a you know learning your teammates getting your timing down with your receivers if you're a quarterback you know what all these, those different things it hurts you, and, and I understand that, um, but it, it just it's also creating a lot of issues. And then the, the two signing days, I mean, really, what's the point? Like, you're just putting a huge burden on coaches and stuff who are trying to do the recruiting side of things while also trying to prepare for a bowl game or a playoff game or whatever. Uh, and now that you've got 12 teams, that's more coaches who are going to be playing a very meaningful game that are having to manage, you know, all that stuff as well. And that's why you're seeing a lot of the coaches being driven out of the sport. Not only is it year round a lot more than the NFL, but you've got, you know, some very stressful times where you're trying to manage very, I mean, you can't forget the most primary thing is the next game. That's what you preach as a coach in a program. But at the same time, you got to be looking towards the future with your recruiting and making sure you're staying on top of that. Because if you just solely focus on the next game and that costs you something as far as, you know, a key player or two that can affect you, you know, down the road. So it's like, it, it's having to manage way too much. And I think that it, through your solution, that would resolve some of a lot of the issues, but it's like I said, anytime I come up with something that I want to pitch, I, I then start to think, how does that really impact how, and, and maybe I'm trying to hang on to something that just isn't going to exist anymore. Like there is no solution where you keep that, love for the sport that you that we we once had as far as regional love riding your 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 team your conference uh you know it, it's kind of like what has made apple so popular it's the fact that their brand people associate who they are as a person with that brand like i've, I've heard people talk about the apple logo like you can have a laptop and slap stickers all over it uh you know if you've got a, a regular pc 
but if you are, uh, but if you have a, a MacBook or something, that Apple logo on the back of it, very rarely people cover that up because they want people to know that they got an Apple computer. It's like who they are as a person is attached to that brand. College football has captured that to a degree that, I mean, even the apples of the world can never touch. And that's why fans get so, they attack, you know, when you're not doing well, they get very aggressive. They get disappointed. They get disheartened because they've, who they are as a fan is attached or who they are as a person is attached to their fandom. And that represents so much of who they are. So when you're disappointing on the field, they're, you know, it's like you're affecting their lives more than I think maybe that it should. But I, th- I think that's created something pretty beautiful at the end of the day. And uh, I mean, at a certain point, uh, that's going to go away um, with some of these solutions, but it, it might have to. Well, uh, Quinn, Quinn kind of mentioned this, and then you kind of touched on the aspect of loyalty and everything with it going on. So kind of, and we asked about uh, save and leaving um, college football. Kind of my viewpoint was that the NIL and transfer portal were getting a little too tough for him and his time as a head coach, having to manage everything, having to do all that. And some people have mentioned the aspect of what Quinn said, a commissioner and that commissioner being Saban a couple of years down the road, if that's where it leads. What are your thoughts on that? Maybe Nick Saban being the the voice of college football, being the NCAA itself, basically. Uh, I think if you wanted to do what was best for college football, that's exactly what you do. I think you'd be the right person for the job. If you think having the SEC office in Birmingham doesn't already create enough issues as far as people thinking that decisions are made to help or aid Alabama, let Nick Saban, who is the greatest college football coach of all time. He won six national championships at Alabama. Let him become essentially the commissioner and anything that people disagree with, they're going to say that he's doing it because he's trying to help Alabama or trying to give them so- some sort of advantage. Uh, so I think that while if you can stay level-headed about it, you can realize a lot of what he's pitched over the years, it wasn't to help Alabama. It was to help college football. Uh, and I think people get way too locked into you know, um, this idea that he was trying to help Alabama. But that would make sense. And I will say, I can remember I can remember sitting in, in Saban's office when I was in high school. My best friend, William Ming, I'm sure uh, Freddie knows him. Um, he was going through the recruiting process. He, he went to Alabama, played for Nick Saban 2009 to, I think, 2013 or 2014. But I, I remember it was, you know, just a couple of years after Nick Saban had left the Dolphins. And he was talking to us, and he said, what I didn't like about the NFL – was the fact that every single day uh, there was a new player in my office essentially asking for more money, feeling disrespected because they feel like they're a top five corner and they're, pay- they're, the, they're the seventh highest paid corner. And they wanted to be that uh, their money to reflect their value to the league and to the team, uh, the franchise. And he, you know, he, because he had a connection with the players more so than the GM, guys would be coming to him with those concerns or questions or comments or whatever and he would always say that's not my role you know you need to go see the gm about this and it became a huge headache for him and you know he made the pitch he said william if you come and play here you're going to be getting the same thing that mark ingram's making which is a college scholarship uh who had you know who had just had a lot of success as a freshman in 2008 and i think college football started to become a lot more like the nfl and i do think at some point you are going to need to have a general manager style of guy on the college level you need to be able to separate the two uh i think the fact that the head coach can can say that he doesn't have a lot of say so in nil right now i think that's beneficial because if they did and players knew it it would be causing all kinds of headaches for for coaches i mean more so than it already is but um i do think that that drove Nick. I wouldn't say that that was the reason he retired. I think it was a combination of things, but it wasn't, it's, it was the constant going out uh, and recruiting high school kids. It's having to recruit, to retain your own staff, fighting to keep your own staff. It was, ha- you know, you know that you're going to lose some guys. It's going to replace a lot of them, uh, you know, in doing a ton of interviews, but not only on, on top of all that, which he had already he always had to do. He also had to constantly be recruiting his own guys and making sure every player in that locker room that he wanted to keep in that locker room was happy. And that was just, it It became a lot. I mean, used to, whether it was right, wrong, or whatever, you recruit 25 guys, and the second they sign on that dotted line, it's like, I don't really have to be nice to you anymore. Like, we've got you now. And it became like the tough love, like, 
all this. You're the greatest thing I've ever seen. I mean, and that's how it was. Uh, now it's like, you got to continue to treat everybody like they're the greatest thing ever. And it's like, well, if you think I'm so great or I'm this great player, why am I not playing? You know, and it's this constant battle. And I think that that just, that got to be a lot. And it's not just Nick Saban, folks. I will say, you, you think that it is because he's 72, 73 years old. It's, I mean, I don't think Kirby Smart at his age is too far off. I'm not saying he's going to leave Georgia uh, necessarily, but I think that right now he is not happy with the headache that is coming with everything that he has to do. And maybe Kirby would just where he set up when you're at the top of the sport. Well, you know, why would you leave? But, you know, there are going to be some guys who are near the top who don't want to deal with that headache anymore. And you're going to see the sport suffer as a result with, you know, because guys who are great leaders of young men are now choosing to move on somewhere else because they don't like the way everything's set up. And that's just, that's part of it. Man, God bless these, uh, the, these college football coaches. Cause I know I would not be able to do it. I mean, that's that it's definitely a special calling. Um, but Clint, man, I should do appreciate you joining in on the show, man. It's been great to have these conversations and, um, maybe, you know, whenever you do get paid enough to make those decisions, we can have you back on. Uh, so <laughs> I appreciate yeah, it. I've, I've, I've had a lot of fun fellas. It, it, it's, I don't really feel like I have, uh, a whole lot of solutions to a lot of these problems, but I will, I, I like addressing the problems cause I think they need to be addressed. I mean, it's right. not like we're, we're the only people addressing them, but. I think the more that these conversations are hashed out and had, uh, it's only going to be beneficial for the sport. Uh, maybe you can start to find some solutions uh, that can actually help. But a lot's changing. But, guys, I appreciate you all having me on. This has been a ton of fun.